Mike has asked me to speak uh, a little bit about the history of the drawings and their character. And in preparing for today's talk, one of the things that um, I learned is, is just how um, startling the, these drawings were when they were donated to the Yale University Library uh, in 1934. Uh, and, and I hope in the context or in the course of my comments today, uh, I can convey uh, some of the reason why that gift um, was startling. In 1839, the Spanish slave ship Amistad set sail from Havana to Puerto Principe, Cuba. Uh, the ship carried 53 Africans, a Mende a people, who a few months earlier had been abducted from their homeland in Africa to be sold as slaves in Cuba in violation of uh, then um, uh, legal uh, agreements. Um, the Africans um, aboard the ship revolted against the ship's crew, killing the captain and others, but sparing the lives of the ship's navigator um, so that they could compel him to set a course back to Africa. Instead, the na navigator surreptitiously directed the ship north and west. He would sail east during the day and, and then adjust course every evening. And after several weeks, the Amistad was seized by the US Navy off the coast of Long Island. Uh, in early September of 1839, um, the Mende people were transported to New Haven to await trial for mutiny, murder, and piracy. Uh, slavery advocates in the United States held that the Amistad prisoners were slaves and thus should be punished for their uprising and immediately returned to Cuba. But abolitionists, on the other hand, argued that though slavery was legal in Cuba, the importation of slaves from Africa had been outlawed decades earlier. Thus they claimed the prisoners in New Haven were not slaves, but free men who had been kidnapped and thus had every right to escape their captors and even to use violence to do so. Uh, the case became important, extremely important to both pro-slavery and abolitionist uh, factions throughout the United States and, and became uh, taken up as part of the ongoing discourse about the future of slavery within the United States, as well as in regard to international debates about treaty obligations um, and uh, the legality of the international slave trade. After two years of legal battles, the case um, of, for the freedom of the captives was successfully argued before the US Supreme Court. Uh, former President John Quincy Adams and uh, New Haven's uh, Roger um, Sherman Baldwin played a major role in presenting the case. Um, many of the captives were returned to Sierra Leone in 1842. Now in the course uh, of the run up to the trials and during uh, the trials and the appeals, um, there was much public discourse and much publicity about the case and several commercial artists, including John Warner Barber, Jay Sketchley and Isaac Sheffield created images of the captives that circulated through the press and the popular culture. And for nearly a century, Afterwards, those were the images that we carried in our minds, uh, in, in popular minds, uh, of who those Mende captives had been. Much less known for the course of that century, however, um, were a set of drawings made by a young resident of New Haven, William H. Townsend. We know very little about Mr. Townsend. His, family New Haven, his family's New Haven roots extended back to his great grandfather, Ebenezer Townsend, who had arrived in New Haven in 1739, nearly a, a century before the Amistad captives. Family tradition says that young William, who was 17 or 18 years old in 1839, had worked delivering groceries to people's homes. And although Townsend left few notes to accompany his sketches, other than the, the captions telling us who his, his subjects were, their names. We now know that he must have approached them very shortly after they arrived in New Haven because one of his sketches portrays Fecorno, who died within a few weeks of arriving in New Haven. 
So, so young William uh, was drawn to this story very, very soon. Um, and he spent time um, doing pencil sketches of at least 22 of the Amistad captives. But unlike the work of Barber, Sketchley, and Sheffield, his drawings don't appear to have been circulated beyond his own or his family's hands or some immediate local circle. They were unknown to scholars or to the general public until 1934, when Mary Auger Dickerman, whose grandmother was Townsend's cousin, donated them to the Yale University Library. In the decades since then, Townsend's drawings have been recognized as the most complete visual record of the Mende who fought for and restored their freedom. In many ways, Townsend's drawings allow us to know more about the Mende than we have been able to learn about him. He died in 1851 at the age of 29 and was buried in Grove Street Cemetery around the corner from the Beinecke Library where his drawings are now preserved. Perhaps it was not coincidental that he was buried in Grove Street Cemetery. After all, it, it is the same cemetery in which six of the Mende captives who died during the course of their captivity were interred. And it's also the cemetery in which um, a number of Yale figures who contributed to um, supporting the case of the captives, uh, including Roger Sherman Baldwin and Josiah Willard Gibbs Sr. Um, are, are buried. Mary Auger Dickerman, who donated the drawings to the library, died two years later in 1936. And she's buried along with a, 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 a long list of Dickerman relatives in Whitneyville Cemetery in Hamden. And I, I sort of say in closing that for those of you with an interest in New Haven history, um, and an interest particularly in, in the story of New Haven's place in this episode in African-Americans fight for freedom, uh, I encourage you to dig into New Haven records to learn more about uh, our, our very um, under understood uh, artist, William Townsend. And now to speak a little bit more about the significance of the case uh, and the story of the captives, I'm gonna turn the mic over to Joy Burns. Thank you, George and Michael. And I'm so glad to be here today. Um, so at the time, the case was certainly very important to all of the abolitionists, to the African-American abolitionists and to white abolitionists as well. And that's why the Tappans Lewis and Arthur took such an interest in the case and, and Arthur indeed created with Simeon Baldwin uh, and other New Haven um, community members, the Amistad Committee. Um, the committee was really dedicated to the health and well being of the captives. So, not just the representation of the captives, but also. Um, were they getting the health care that they needed? Um, Charles Hooker, who was a physician at, at the Yale School of Medicine, um, was their doctor. And indeed, I think it's in the collection at Yale, um, but also perhaps the Connecticut Historical Society. Um, there are copies of letters that um, Charles Hooker wrote to um, Arthur Tappan um, about the health of the Amistad captives. Um, there are several books about the Amistad. Um, Benjamin Lawrence's book, The Amistad Children, is one of my favorites because it describes what the lives of the Amistad children were like while they were um, awaiting the trial in the Supreme Court decision. Um, the children were not held in jail they were actually lived on a farm, um, which is now in the, uh, in the area where uh, Edgewood Park is in New Haven. And um, at the end, after the Supreme Court decision, there was a major court battle, sort of what you would see today would be in all the media, social media, and there would be people from all sides saying all kinds of things. The three parties that fought over the kids were 
um, the Amistad Committee, so the Tappans and Simeon Baldwin, um, the Amistad captives who felt that the children belonged with the captives and should go back to Sierra Leone, um, and the people who had been taking care of them, the Pendletons. Anyway, uh, I could talk about the Amistad in the past a lot, but I also wanted to talk about um, Amistad in um, the more recent past. And so the Amistad Committee has been um, in existence for over 30 years, the current Amistad Committee that we think of today. And Al Martyr has been um, the president for the last 30 years. Um, he's a cherished New Havener. He's 99 years old and smart as a tack. Um, and Vernon Richardson and Hilda Kilpatrick have been longstanding members of what as well. Um, right now, what we're thinking about doing is um, upgrading all of our social media platform presence. Um, it kind of came upon us suddenly during the pandemic. Oh, um, we need to upgrade our website. And so hopefully you'll be seeing more content there. Um, the Amistad Committee, um, the current Amistad Committee created um, and uh, had a competition for the statue of Sinke that is now um, in front of the New Haven um, City Hall and is the official name is the Amistad Memorial. Um, more recently in September of uh, last year, we placed a statue of William Lanson, who was an abolitionist, an activist uh, in New Haven. Uh, and there's a statue of Lanson on um, Canal, on Lock Street, um, off Canal and uh, just off Trumbull Street as well. And the other monument that's so important to Connecticut history, uh, I'm actually wearing a shirt um, that commemorates it and I'll just show you a picture, um, is the uh, Connecticut 29th. Um, and the official name was Connecticut Voluntary Infantry. And this was a group of uh, African-American men and also indigenous men um, who volunteered to fight in um, a, the colored regiments uh, during the Civil War. And they fought from 1863 to 1865. Um, that monument is in Crisulo Park in the Fairhaven section of New Haven. And uh, please go see that monument as well because it's quite beautiful and was also um, created by Ed Hamilton. Um, one of the other uh, physical monuments to um, the Amistad story, the Amistad affair is the ship itself, the replica of the ship. Um, many times it's in Mystic, sometimes it's in New Haven and sometimes it travels um, up and down the Atlantic coast. Um, the official name is Discovering Amistad. And so if you go to www.discoveringamistad.org, you'll find information about the ship there. Um, this year during the pandemic, they've been doing virtual classrooms um, with grades four to 12, um, educating the students about the history of the Amistad and how it relates today to the social justice issues that we find ourselves challenged with. I'm gonna read the purpose of the Amistad Committee, the current Amistad Committee. To promote public awareness of the Amistad affair, its importance in the history of New Haven and the history of the United States. Um, other events that the Amistad Committee has sponsored was a celebration of the life of Paul Robeson at Southern um, Connecticut State University during Black History Month in 2020. Um, an event at the New Haven Museum about Sarah Margu. She's one of the children um, who stayed in the farm out in Edgewood Park, um, what is now Edgewood Park. Uh, and it was entitled A Child of the Amistad, A Dramatic Reading. Uh, and that was in March, 2016. 
Um, another offshoot of the Amistad Committee is the Connecticut Freedom Trail. And um, please also go, I will type both of their uh, email, um, both of their web addresses in the chat box so that you'll be able to click on them and go look at the websites um, for the Freedom Trail, which is all over the state of Connecticut and um, mentions important um, houses, sites, monuments. One of them is Ventra Smith, um, who is up in East Haddam. And uh, he's buried in the cemetery there. And um, there's also uh, I think there's a, um, something in Farmington that's also related to the Amistad story, because after the um, Amistad captains, captives were released, um, they immediately left New Haven. They couldn't wait to get out of New Haven. And they went and stayed um, with um, abolitionist activists in Farmington while the money was being raised for them to return to Sierra Leone. Um, the captives were able to get custody of the children and the children actually returned to Sierra Leone with the adults. Um, Sarah Margu, the, the young girl from the uh, story at the New Haven Museum, when she grew up, she wrote a letter to Lewis Tappan and said, I want to return to the United States. I want more of an education. And she attended Oberlin College. So I think I'm going to uh, toss it back to Michael. And I'm sure he has lots of questions for us uh, that are either his or other people's. Oh, you're muted, Michael. We have many questions coming in, so please uh, uh, share questions with you. We'll get to as many as we can on the chat or on the Q&A. I want to begin with the drawings, and uh, George and Joy have both noted to me they're not art historians, and so I'm not going to put you on the spot to give a sort of expert, but I want, you know, as two people who are deeply engaged with history, uh, you've each seen these drawings, uh, you know, what, what do they evoke for you? What, what kind of reaction uh, and, and insights do they give you? Uh, and then also, and George, you began to do this, um, uh, what would you like to know? What more would you like to know from the drawing since part of the, the purpose of the Mondays at Beinecke is in, to encourage people to go look for themselves and to crowdsource uh, not only answers, but questions. So. To each of you, what's something that that the drawings, you know, how do they strike you and inform you, and what more would you want to know? Mike, the, I, I'm struck by the. I guess I would use the word intimate character of them. You you have a sense that the artist had the opportunity to spend time with his subjects. These 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 aren't thrown together quickly. They're they're not they're neither finished formal portraits, but neither are they rough sketches made, you know, from a, a quick glance at someone passing. Um, there's there's a story that's told in in the article that appeared in the Yale Library Gazette shortly after the drawings were donated that said family lore suggested that Townsend had brought candy or food with him in, in approaching um, the captives to gain confidence, their confidence to gain um, some kind of access to them to have an opportunity to chat with them. And it would be, it breaks my heart as a historian that Townsend didn't leave us a diary or a journal in which he shared some of his thoughts about what he was doing, why he was doing it, what motivated him. Um, as I tried to suggest, we don't have any sense that Townsend ever made any other sketches or drawings. If he did, and they've survived, they're unsigned and unrecognized at the moment. Um, what made him in September of 1839 as, as a young adult, I mean, 17 or 18 still strikes me as, as awfully young, but I suppose in 1839, 
it was older and more mature than would be today, but still very, very young in his life. You know, what, what made him spend the time to do these sketches? And I guess the other question that lurks is, um, we have no idea whether perhaps there were more at some time. You know, is, is this the complete body of work or is this what just survived in family hands? You know, was it split up when Townsend died and sent to different parts of the family and some parts of it haven't made it to us? Um, so, so to me, there's so many um, open, open-ended aspects of the creation of the drawings. Um, I suppose I'd have to be satisfied with a, with a, with a, a novelist's approach to to answering those questions rather than a historian's. That's really great. Thanks, Joy. So I guess my my question would be, is it possible, you know, I, places I would want to look is um, Josiah Gibbs's papers and if there were any letters um, from the Yale students who um, spent time teaching the Yale Divinity School students who spent time teaching them um, the captives English um, because it would be interesting to see if that was one of his inroads into getting to spend time um, with the captives. Um, what's so fabulous about the uh, drawings is they demonstrate the captives humanity. You see they, you, they go from being um, these characters who the, new, who the newspapers had described in certain ways to being people, um, to, be, to having characteristics um, uh, that are unique. Each person looks different. And I, I can imagine that that was certainly one of the things that drew him to want to draw them um, because they look probably different than most people he would ever run into on the streets of New Haven. Um, the, and he humanizes the, the children. You can see their vulnerability. He, um, he, one of the, a couple of the drawings have the men wearing knit caps. And um, I imagine, you know, church ladies knitting uh, and then contributing these caps um, for these men to keep them warm in the winter because New Haven could get so cold. 